Somebody say praise the Lord. He is great and worthy to be praised. He is greater, as I already said, than the temple. He's greater than anything that could come along. We've already heard uh, the beginning of our text, read by Brother Gene this morning. He started us off. We're going to continue in Matthew 12. So let's just uh, well, kind of get it back in our mind here. Uh, he already, uh, the disciples were doing what was unlawful on the Sabbath, right? They were really hungry, so they were rolling some kernels of grain in their hand and eating as they walked through the grain fields. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes, teachers of the law, however we want to name them, right? The religious leaders were once again all hot and bothered by what Jesus and his followers were up to and not happy at all with their conduct. As we talked about in the children's message, Jesus reminds them that they need to be actually reading the law, not just quoting the parts they like, right, or that they're familiar with. They need to actually read the thing. And then he reminds them that something greater than the law is present. It's Jesus Christ. He is the living word of God. Amen? Remember in the beginning was the word and the word was with God? The word was God. That's Jesus Christ, John 1. In the beginning. And he encourages us, exhorts us to go show mercy rather than just the sacrifice or the sacrificial system. The law code is what Jesus is referring to. Now we pick up in verse 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Matthew 12, verse 9 to 14, and then 22 to 30. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. That's the Jewish temple. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Moving on to verse 22. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, "'Could this be the son of David?' But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub... By whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. (laughs) Verse 29. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. The word of God for the people of God. (sighs) I find myself saying something like this every week, but Jesus doesn't let his foot up off the gas, does he? Every chapter, every verse. Wow, he's just going for it. Such good things this morning. But first, I want to remind us kind of where we're at. I I mentioned earlier we're coming to the end of our Living Ministry series. We've been talking about how we can live our faith, right? Christian faith is not something we do on Sunday morning. It's not something we do when we show up to help with the garage sale. It's not something we just do on last Sundays when we feed the community at neighbor's table. Those things are all ministry. But ministry is and ought to be our whole life. 
It's everything we do. It's how we treat our spouse at home. It's how we treat our, our aging parents. It's how we treat our kids and our grandkids. It's how we treat our neighbors. It's how we treat each other. And how we reach out into the community, how we love our neighbors and our brothers and sisters and folks who God puts in our life who don't have a relationship with him yet. Which ones of those things are living ministry? All of them, all of them. But you know, when we live ministry for the Lord, there will be days when we come under attack. You know, we've been, uh, I've been preparing for this pastor's Bible study that we're doing on Tuesday uh, every other Tuesday evening. Our next one is this Tuesday. If you're in that class, I hope to see you there. But folks, I, this isn't, I hope this isn't too much of a spoiler alert for our Bible study group. But as I've been studying Matthew more in depth, preparing for this sermon series and for the Bible study, I've noticed that Jesus runs into opposition in almost every chapter. It's just about every other chapter in Matthew. 28 chapters and every other one, Jesus runs into opposition at least once. And many chapters, it's two or three different instances where he's being opposed, sometimes by demon possession, often uh, by, um, by the religious leaders of his time. Most often, it's the religious leaders that form the opposition that Jesus is running into. For today, as we look at this text, we're going to look at it from a different perspective than I think we usually look at this text. Most sermons I've heard on this text, and great ones, are about the Sabbath, right? And about how Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And we're kind of applying that Sabbath rest principle, whether it's the seventh day of the week or whether it's the first day of the week as Christians, right? But that concept of Sabbath and what it means to have... But we're not going to talk about that this morning. Today, at least, we cannot escape... As we go through Matthew, folks, I would be remiss if I let us go through this entire sermon series and never once talked about all of this opposition that Jesus runs into. And in this chapter, part of the reason I'm doing it this week is because we see several kinds. Jesus runs into demon possession, and Jesus has a couple run-ins with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. He comes to loggerheads, multiple times with the religious leaders of his day. Now, this seems maybe like an odd topic to finish our living ministry series together. Why are we talking about the religious opposition that Jesus runs into? Folks, I'll tell you why. Spoiler alerts. I'm not leaving anything to the end of this message. I'm going to talk about why we're having it right here up front. Because when you live the ministry that Jesus Christ is calling you to live, if you're giving sacrificially, if you're serving sacrificially, if you're committed to your church, if you're showing up and volunteering, if you're doing ministry, if you're singing in the choir, if you're playing in the handbells, if you're helping feed the team, if you're doing and serving and living and preaching and missioning and living for Jesus and showing his love, guess what? There will be opposition. When you follow Jesus closely, you will be opposed, just like he's being opposed. Living ministry is in large part about how we deal with spiritual attack, how we deal with opposition. Is that fair to say? You don't have to answer. Do I see any heads moving? If you're living ministry for Jesus, there will be opposition. You will come under attack. That's how it works. Now, Lest we get too afraid about that, we'll talk more about it later. So bookmark that. But G the main thing that Jesus seems to keep running into is the religious leaders of his day. Everyone say religious leaders. Whew, boy. And let's, let's remember, before we rag on them too badly, there were a few. Remember Nicodemus who came at night? Others who helped take care of Jesus' body? There were religious leaders in the Jews who got it who heard the message and came to Jesus. But in the, but in the way that the gospel writers tend to set up the narrative, especially in Matthew, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the scribes, these are the folks who are most often the antagonists to Jesus' message. That's just the way it went down. So why have religious leadership? 
Jesus doesn't seem to have a very high opinion of them. Every time he turns around, he's telling them, go back, read the Old Testament again. Haven't you read the law? Don't you know the law and the prophets? Didn't you guys spend your life studying this stuff? Right? Jesus doesn't seem to have a very high view of the religious. So why, why, ha- why, have, why have bishops? Why have district superintendents? Why have pastors? Why have religious leaders? Why? Let's just, let's, just, let's just peel that layer of the onion back for a second. Why do we have religious leaders? Uh, by the way, I'm not attempting to get myself fired this morning. Um, I, mean, I mean, if you feel led to go that route, but it's not necessarily my goal. Yeah, Jesus opposed the religious leaders a lot, but what is Jesus going to do just four chapters later? He is going to commission Peter, right? He's going to say, on this rock, I will build my church. So there we have the affirmation of the beginning of apostolic leadership, the apostolic succession, right? We have that affirmation of the church that's going to be built and that needs leaders. But then what does Jesus do just a few verses later? Get behind me, Satan, he tells Peter, right? You remember? It's just a couple verses after he said, on this rock, I will build my church. Just a couple verses later, Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You don't have in mind God's things, Peter, when you're saying, no, no, you're not going to die on the cross. Jesus said, no, I have a mission to fulfill. So, I don't believe Jesus is being fickle here, brothers and sisters, but guess what? He does expect his religious leaders, one of whom he was grooming Peter to be, can we all agree he was grooming Peter to be a religious leader, a leader in the church? Jesus does expect religious leaders to help and further the cause of the kingdom and not hinder it. I think that's the basic litmus test for what is good spiritual religious leadership or not. Is it helping the cause of the kingdom and the gospel or is it hindering the cause of the kingdom and the gospel? So to dig into this a little deeper, I polled a few of my pastor friends and asked them, so what's the purpose of religious leadership? I'm going to let them remain anonymous, but here's what some of them said. One of them said, he summed it up really succinctly. He said, the purpose of religious leadership is to lead and organize God's people. Okay, I think that's, a, that's, that's, that's pretty fair. Uh, the next pastor I, I asked said, uh, he quoted Ephesians 4, 12 to 13, and said, the purpose is, I quote from Ephesians, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the biblical reason. But then here's what he said. He said, oh, this is scathing. And this is why I can't say his name. Look out. But he did say this in his own sermon, so he's a brave guy. All right, everybody's seatbelts buckled? Better check and make sure your, your harnesses are securely in place. But here's the purpose for average cultural Christians. Are you right? Casual, casual cultural Christians. The purpose of religious leadership is to make sure my church has all of the necessary ministries to make me feel good about myself and, to, and, and my family just to, and give us just enough Jesus to help us sleep at night and to make sure that we have all the people we need for the annual turkey dinner. They didn't fire him, I think. The day is young yet. He's still there. Okay, let's just be real honest. Okay, and I'm going to be real honest. I'm going to go back a few years. When I wasn't a pastor yet, I was the full-time youth guy, right? A lot of times the things I wanted from the church we were serving wasn't that dissimilar. I wanted a hopping youth program and children's program that was just right for my kids and fit all my family's personal needs and desires and wants. Casual cultural Christians, folks. We're just looking for church leadership to make things comfortable and provide the kind of ministries I think are important. Wow. So, wow. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1. this is another pastor friend responded with this. Follow my example, Paul is saying to Corinth, as I follow the example of Christ. And that's basically what we've been talking about this month. Amen? Right? 
We've been talking about following teacher, right? Being, Jesus is our example. We want to follow him. So that pastor friend was basically saying that. Well, I'm thankful for their input, folks. But as I researched a little bit, kind of here's my take. Are you ready? Here's my take on why we need to have religious leaders. Why religious leaders are worth keeping around. Just four reasons. First is to set an example in word and life and service. To set an example, right? James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I believe in Scripture, both these things are true, that all of us, all Christians, I believe in the priesthood of believers, we are all called to the same standard, and that is that of Jesus Christ. And yet, the Scripture makes it plain that religious leaders are going... And, Lord, help me, right? But religious leaders are going to be held to a higher standard. This is not just James. We see that in other scriptures as well. So setting an example. Religious leaders need to set an example. Second, they need to keep and teach doctrinal and biblical knowledge. We all should be studying our word. We all should be learning our doctrine and owning it. But religious leaders are historically charged with being a source for biblical and doctrinal knowledge. Absolute, do your own research. Do your own study. Keep growing. I hope you learn way more than I know. But religious leaders are charged with being a, a keeper of doctrinal and biblical knowledge so that we can help answer questions and help lead and troubleshoot things as they come up in a spiritual way. So as you, lead, as you live your ministry, that's something you can use me for. If you want to check Check some truth, check some doctrine. What does the Bible really mean when it says this here? By all means, I need to be available to you for that. That's part of how we can live ministry together. That's part of a role I can serve. And then you can reject what I say or accept it, but I'm, I can be a sounding board that way. So please, when you're studying the scripture, don't hesitate to shoot me a text or an email. I love that. Third, we need religious leaders to maintain good order in the church. And by that, and this is in our book of discipline, by the way, in the Methodist Church, but maintaining good order in the church, good practice for the sacraments of communion and baptism, confirmation, sound leadership practices and structures. Those things are things that God's Word and God's church have historically charged pastors and district superintendents, religious leaders have been charged with these things. So that good order, peace. And fourth, to help set boundaries for belief and practice of faith so that we can retain the essentials of what is Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, what the church has always held to be true about the mighty works, teachings, and acts of Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord and Savior. That's what spiritual leadership's for. Now, dealing with spiritual attacks, folks, as you live ministry, you know, sometimes... When you feel like you're under attack, oftentimes it's not just a coincidence. A lot of times, a lot of times, it's because you're living for the Lord. It's because you love Jesus. And our enemy does not appreciate that. Doesn't like that. So spiritual attacks, sometimes they're, often they're spiritually driven. Remember, Ephesians 6 tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the invisible powers and principalities of this dark world and this dark age. That is what our, our struggle is never against brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters, even the ones we disagree with, that's not the struggle. The struggle is with the spiritual principalities that we can't see, spiritual forces of evil. So sometimes these attacks come from within, Sometimes there are brothers and sisters sitting next to us. Sometimes we'll be agents of that attack. But a lot of times the opposition will come from above in leadership, just like happened to Jesus. Every other chapter in Matthew, and sometimes more than once, oftentimes the attacks come from above. So folks, here's an encouragement. We never blindly follow human leadership. And again, nothing about this message is self-serving. Never, ever blindly do what I ask or say. Ever. Ever. Don't blindly follow people. Ever. 
We've talked about this, I think, at least last week, maybe the week before it was mentioned as well. Hold me to Scripture. Check me against God's Word. Don't just take what I say and run with it. Don't give that kind of power to any human being. We don't just blindly obey people. Instead, we answer only to God and God alone. God is who I will stand before to give an account one day, not any human being, brothers and sisters. Amen? God is who you will stand before to give account. And when you stand before the throne, you won't be able to say, well, the pastor told me to do it. Well, the, the bishop showed up at conference and he said, you're going to stand before the Lord. He is the one before whom you will ultimately give an account. And we won't be able to plead ignorance. We follow God and God alone. We do put our trust in and obey God as revealed to us in Scripture. In all things, we want to obey our Lord and Savior. We are also taught to submit and obey in Scripture. So folks, here's what I kind of want to conclude with today. And then there's a challenge. How do we know when not to obey our religious leaders? Because the Bible talks about submitting to our spiritual authorities, doesn't it? Many places. The Bible talks about obeying and honoring and respecting those that God has put over us in the Lord. (sighs) It's like, okay, so which is it, Lord? Well, we are supposed to obey our authorities to the extent that we can and as they're following Scripture. See, it's all about we compare what God is saying to what we hear our spiritual leaders saying. And when you're hearing your spiritual leaders saying something that doesn't line up with what God is teaching you in his word, that's where you need to gently come and oppose me. A gentle, appropriate opposition. That's that helping me remove my speck, right? That Matthew talked about earlier. So here, just in our text, there's lots of other places we could look in scripture to get answers for this, but when should you not listen to your spiritual authority? When is your spiritual authority not to be listened to? Let's just look at this text, just here in this one chapter. Ready, folks? This is hard stuff, but if you want to live ministry, if you're serious about it, then discerning when to obey spiritual leaders and when not to is a huge part of living ministry. Are you ready? Are we ready? All right. Most of us are ready. Folks, if you're religious leaders, if they stop you from being kind to someone else. If your religious leaders are either being very unkind themselves and teaching you to be also, or stopping you from being kind to someone, that religious leader needs to be ignored in that instance. They need to not be listened to there. Verse 10, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Here's Jesus being kind. He has this crippled, stretch out his hand. He restores it to be just like the other. And they call him on it like he's done something bad or something wrong. Remember, he reminds them, just like I talked about with the kids, about showing mercy rather than being so concerned about the laws. You might say, well, our religious leaders today don't do that. They don't stop us from being kind. Oh, really? Really? Give that one some thought for a few minutes. Pray about it later. Stopping us from being kind? That's just one. But here in our text, just living in our text, if spiritual authorities, if they put human-made laws above God's laws, things that we came up with, whether they're religious laws we made up or cultural laws we made up, when we put Human-made laws above God's laws. Because guess what? Someone greater than the temple is here. Someone greater than the temple is here. Jesus is here. If our religious leaders are saying things like, never mind what God's word says, we know better. Follow what we say rather than God's word. Look out. I pray you never ever hear words that sound like that from me. And anytime you feel like I'm saying something like that, again, please gently oppose me. That is a religious leader or religious leadership that needs to be lovingly checked. 
by the body of believers. Let's just, because when we do that, when we, when we say that the rules we've come up with are more important than what God says, we're, that's the Pharisees all over. We're doing our Pharisee impression. That's what's happening. Here's another one right from our text. If religious leaders are saying that the moral code is more important than showing mercy and love, hitting people over the head with the rules, like I was talking about with the kids, folks who are broken, folks who are living in sin, folks who are in pain, folks who are hurting, folks who desperately need to be shown love in a radical and passionate way, folks who need the healing of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, folks who need what only the church can bring. And if we're saying no, hit them over the head with the rule book instead, that is religious leadership that ought to be ignored because they're wrong. We don't dress like that in church. I've had congregants say that to folks that came in to worship. Young man, if you're going to come in church, you need a nicer shirt on. I have heard congregations, congregants say things like this before. Not here, praise the Lord. At least not yet. Right? What's more important, showing mercy or following our rules that we've come up with? Congregants who might accidentally say things like, well, we don't want their kind here. I've heard religious leaders say this as well. We don't want their kind here? What children of God do we not want here? What people made in the image of God do we not want to welcome here in worship so they can meet the Jesus we know and be convicted by the Holy Spirit? Praise the Lord. Here's another one. If religious leaders call God's work evil, remember blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that unforgivable sin? When the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus said later, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. First of all, in case you're wondering if you've committed the unforgivable sin, let me put your mind at ease. Okay, I had a seminary professor who said this, and this was brilliant. He said, if you are worried that you may have committed the unforgivable sin, and you're concerned about that, then you surely have not. If you think you may have committed the unforgivable sin and that bothers you and you're worried about it, then you surely have not, okay? God is not a legalist. Satan is a legalist. God is not, all right? But attributing, here's what strikes a little closer to home church, attributing powerful movements and powerful works and acts of the Holy Spirit, healings, tongues, words of knowledge, I don't know. Attributing works of the Holy Spirit and saying they came from the enemy? That's dangerous stuff. When the Holy Spirit is at work, we want to be louder than we were on the sidelines or watching our TV when we, when we walked Heron the other day, okay? When the Holy Spirit is doing stuff, we want to be cheering. When Julia comes up out of the water at second service, we need to be cheering because that's the Holy Spirit at work and never ever mocking or belittling the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Amen? That's what we want to cheer on. That's what we want to see more of. Finally, Jesus says, whoever, does not, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Folks, this is an obvious one. If religious leaders get to the point where they're no longer with Jesus, then guess what? They're against them, against him. And those are not leaders we want to follow. As you live ministry, follow leaders who are following Jesus and test them with God's word. There we go. In other words, if your religious leaders forbid you from preaching the gospel of repentance of sins in Jesus' name, if you have religious leaders that discourage you from talking about salvation by his gracious, gracious propitiation on the cross and or eternal hope of life, everlasting life in his presence, then those leaders must be rejected just as Jesus rejected many of the leaders in his day. Now, where does that leave us? We're going to conclude here. Where does that leave us this morning? Folks, no matter what happened in his earthly ministry, no matter what the opposition, 
no matter what the personal attack. And even as he hung on the cross of Calvary, Jesus submitted to the Father in all things. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus was deferring to the Father and begging mercy on all of us, even as he hung and died. That's what living ministry is about. Obeying Father God, no matter what the cost, no matter what the consequences, professional, personal, or otherwise, whatever the cost, we have to obey God, brothers and sisters. Follow Jesus. Amen? Let's pray and ask for strength to do that. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your example. Lord God, we thank you for your life and your witness. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in it. God, I pray for each of my brothers and sisters this morning who are here. God, humble me. Humble each of us. Lord, humble our leaders in the Methodist church. Lord, humble us all. Humble us, Lord to submit to your way and to submit to your word and to seek you and to follow you in all things. Lord God, Lord Jesus, even as you submitted to your Father in all things, may we submit to your lordship and follow your leadership in all things to who we pray. Give us strength as we live ministry in your name. And everyone said together, amen. Let us stand.